I just want to welcome you. I'm Elizabeth Jofrian. I'm the Director of Heritage Resources uh, here at the library. And in that role, I have the honor and privilege of providing stewardship over the library's archives, manuscripts, and special collections. Um, special collections is here in Wilson Library. It's where you are right now. And then we have two departments on the south side of campus, the Center for Pacific Northwest Studies and the University Archives. How many of you have visited us before? So for some of you, it's the first. And I would really encourage you guys to come back. You'll hear today about some of the wonderful research that can be done in our collections. In fact, uh, this talk, Laura's talk, uh, is the first in this year's Distinguished Lecture Series that's sponsored here by Heritage Resources. And the speakers that participate um, in the series have one thing in common. Uh, that is that they're considered authorities in their field of research and that they've done extensive research uh, in our collections. And so it's a real privilege to, to have Laura kick off uh, this year's series. Um, she's done, for as long as I've been at Western, I've been at Western for what? off and on since 1998. I've, I've had two iterations here at Western. Laura has been doing research with us and a good bit of that on Ella Higginson. And I think my staff and I have learned a great deal about this historical figure uh, from, from, um, from Laura's work. And it's been a real pleasure over the years. She's been an ally and a mentor uh, and a real friend to the archives. So it's really nice to turn around and honor her uh, in this way. I also hear from students consistently what a wonderful teacher, mentor, uh, Laura is to them and how they've how she's influenced their careers. So I thought instead of me doing the bio for or introduction for Laura uh, that we would have one of her former students uh, introduce her. So uh, it's with pleasure that I introduce Clarissa Mansfield. Clarissa is our communications officer and a person who does a great deal of work helping us uh, to publicize the series. So uh, Clarissa will do the honors of introducing Laura and I'll turn over this mic very gently. Okay, I'm gonna join Beth and welcoming all of you. It's really great to see all of you here. Um, I'm really pleased to get to be here. And um, as she mentioned, the Heritage Resources um, Distinguished Speakers, it focuses on people who are authorities in their respective fields who have used the Heritage Resources significantly. Today's speaker is not just an authority in her field. She happens to be one of my most favorite people in the world. <laughs> Uh, as an undergraduate student here at Western back in 1999, I had the great pleasure of being in one of her early American Lit classes. It's no secret that Western has a number of talented and caring faculty, um, but there are certain professors who are so amazing. They make such an impact on their students, they become truly unforgettable. Laura is one of those truly unique, truly amazing, truly wonderful educators. She impacted me in many, many ways. She worked with me both inside and outside of her classroom to help me become a better student, a better writer, and a better communicator. She is insightful, perceptive, eloquent, and so smart. She was and is incredibly popular with all of her students and with good reason. She brings out the best in them because of the way she encourages them and challenges them and engages them. And she also happens to be hilarious. Her sense of humor enriches her classroom every day. In 1996, Laura was awarded the Faculty Excellence in Teaching Award. It would not surprise me at all to learn of other numerous nominations made by all the students she's affected over the years. Laura is so good at what she does. You can't help but be captivated and inspired by her knowledge and passion and enthusiasm. Her infectious personality and generosity positively impact those around her, which makes her, as you will soon see for yourself, the perfect advocate for restoring Ella Higginson to her rightful place of prominence. Laura has published widely on American literature. Her books include Uncommon Women, Gender and Representation in 19th Century U.S. Women's Writing, and also Hawthorne's Literature for Children. Her current research project is based on Bellingham's own neglected author, Ella Higginson, and her most recent book is Selected Works of Ella Higginson, Inventing Pacific Northwest Literature. It gives me great pleasure to introduce to you now award-winning professor of English at Western Washington University and someone whom I admire greatly, Professor Laura Lafredo. <laughs> it could not have been 1999. <laughs> oh my goodness. Um, I feel like I should have been warned that I was going to have that kind of a wonderful introduction. That was, that was very, very nice. Um, and I refuse to believe that Clarissa was my student in 1999. I'm sure it was much more recently than that. <laughs> Oh my goodness, thank you all so much for coming today. Um, thank you for that wonderful introduction, and I'm so pleased to have been invited to, um, 
to speak about my work at the Center for Pacific Northwest Studies, work that is very near and dear to my heart. Um, as you know, for this talk, my work at the Pacific Northwest, um, the Center for Pacific Northwest Studies, led to, directly to the publication of, of this book, Selected Writings of Ella Higginson, Inventing Pacific Northwest Literature. It brings Ella Higginson's work back into print for the first time in many decades. It is, um, it is a very big deal, and it gives me, it gives me more pleasure than um, I, can, I can tell you. I'm particularly pleased to be speaking um, here in Special Collections during um, um, during Washington Archives Month in October. That seems particularly apt to me. Before I begin to talk, I would like to acknowledge that we do live on Lummi ground and to express my gratitude for being allowed to share this beautiful land, especially on such a beautiful and stunning day. Thank you all for being inside while we're having this great weather. My current, um, oh, let's do this in order then. Um, part one, Ella Higginson. My current research project is a multifaceted undertaking that is focused on forgotten Pacific Northwest author Ella Higginson. As part of that project, a book that I've edited, Selected Writings of Ella Higginson, has recently been published by the Whatcom County Historical Society. And as a matter of fact, everybody who looks at this book, they glance at it, and what everyone says as soon as they see it is how gorgeous this title is, right? Uh, this, uh, this cover is with the photograph by Darius Kinsey in the back, the beautiful Pacific Northwest Green. Um, the Whatcom County Historical Society's book designer, Kim Cunningham, is here, who, um, who designed this book and is, is more t has more artistic talent than one person should really be allowed. Um, selected Writings of Ella Higginson contains the... Um, so I'm just losing my place here. I'm so happy to be here. There we go. <laughs> Contains the poems and the short stories for which Higginson won awards. I do refer to this as Ella Higginson's greatest hits. I wanted the things that she would, the pieces that she was most well known for in her lifetime to be the ones that came back into print first. The poems and the short stories for which Higginson won awards and for which she was celebrated, as well as excerpts from her one completed novel, Mariella of Out West, and from her book of, of nonfiction, Alaska, the Great Country. Country. My book returns Higginson's work to print for the first time in many decades. It also presents in its introduction and in its supplementary material newly recovered biographical information that has long been unknown or forgotten. I am utterly convinced that Ella Higginson will haunt me for having recovered this information. It is a, she tried to hide this information a great deal. It is a price. Well, it's a price that I say that I'm willing to pay, but that could be bluster on my part. When she begins to haunt me, that could be something else entirely. Um, it was in a fairly accidental way that I came to appoint myself in charge of recovering Ella Higginson's work and reputation for American literature. I know that sounds very grand here. I'd like to say that I reached this point as a result of admirable professional planning, but that was not at all the case. Um, rather, I had gone to the Center for Pacific Northwest Studies when I was finishing the final chapter of my second book, Uncommon Women, and I arrived at the Center for Pacific Northwest Studies on a time-honored archival fishing expedition. I was looking for material about post-Civil War um, white women, and I did not find that material at all. That's, I mean, as a fishing expedition, you might not. But what I did find was the list of archived holdings in the Center for Pacific Northwest Studies. As I read the list, and like everybody in this room, I'm absolutely convinced I will pretty much read anything that you put in front of me. And if it's a list of archived holdings, I'll really read it. Um, when I read that list, I saw that the center had 12 linear feet of material by someone named Ella Higginson, who I had certainly never, never heard of. At that moment, which now has its own significance for me, and I think it's, it's very good of me to have a moment that has significance for me where I look um, utterly clueless, but um, two things came together. A literary scholar whose work focuses on 19th century US women writers, that would be me, encountered her first mention of a rich archive of work by a neglected 19th century US woman writer. I almost couldn't believe what I was looking at. I will spare you the details of my gradual early progress, but if you run into me on campus, I may tell you anyway, so um, go the other way if you see me coming, um, um, which was conducted piecemeal on the periphery of my attention as I finished one book, wrote articles, and taught my students. 
By the time that I was ready to begin a new project, I had slowly come to understand that Ella Rhodes Higginson had been a late 19th century, early 20th century U.S. white woman writer in the Pacific Northwest who had been prolific, talented, and prominent, and who was almost entirely forgotten. I considered this information knowing that I was equipped with the necessary scholarly tools, including tenure. With feminist fervor, I don't fool around, <laughs> with feminist fervor and with a sturdy sense of literary justice that taken together might enable me to begin to remedy this neglect. And so in the absence of anyone else working on Ella Higginson, and I would have paid good money to have someone else in the room with me at that point who I could have turned to um, and perhaps pushed some work onto. Um, and with a considerable amount of trepidation considering the, consider, sorry, concerning the research that would need to be conducted, I decided to take on the responsibility of returning Higginson and her work to both local and national prominence. If I had had any idea how much work this would have been, I absolutely still would have done it, but I would have been had even more trepidation there. Please allow me to briefly introduce Ella Higginson, and this is from um, the very beginning of the introduction that I wrote for this book. Though Ella Rhodes Higginson is little known today, over a century ago she was the most influential Pacific Northwest literary writer in the United States. People across the nation and around the world were first introduced to the Pacific Northwest and the people who lived there when they read Higginson's award-winning poetry, fiction, and nonfiction. I really cannot, um, I, I really can't overemphasize how well-known and how popular she was. Higginson's descriptions of the majestic mountains, vast forests, and scenic waters of the Puget Sound presented the then remote, unfamiliar Pacific Northwest to eager readers. Her distinctive characterizations of the white women and men who inhabited the region revealed to readers what it was like to live in this particular part of the United States as opposed to other more well-known regions such as New England or the American South. Higginson's celebrated writings were the very first to prominently place the Pacific Northwest on the literary map of the United States. If you consider a map of the United States, at that part, in terms of American literature, there was nothing in the Pacific Northwest. It's as though it really didn't exist in terms of any kind of literary attention it, until Higginson began publishing. Higginson's talent was widely recognized during her lifetime. She had a major New York publisher in the prestigious Macmillan Company. She was awarded Best Short Story Prizes from well-known magazines such as Collier's, McClure's, and Peterson's. Many of her poems were set to music and performed internationally by celebrated dramatic singers such as Enrico Caruso, who was wildly popular at the time. And in 1931, Higginson was chosen to be the first Poet Laureate of Washington State. In her day, Higginson and her writing attracted international literary attention to the Pacific Northwest. Higginson was the author of two collections of short stories, six books of poetry, a novel, a travel book, over 100 short stories, over 300 poems, and hundreds of newspaper essays. I have not been able to catalog all the newspaper essays yet, but, but I'm about to do so. If anybody is interested in the number of newspaper essays, please email me in a month and I will be more than happy to tell you. Um, Higginson's work appeared in the leading periodicals of the day, such as the Atlantic, Harper's Bazaar, and McClure's Magazine. Many of her poems and stories were later widely reprinted in other magazines and newspapers across the nation, and for reasons utterly beyond me, in some literary periodical in New Zealand in the early 20th century. I have absolutely no idea why. I'm grateful because it's given me some information, but it's a very weird site. Um, her work was published alongside writings by prominent American and British authors, such as Arthur Conan Doyle, author, of course, of the Sherlock Holmes series, Thomas Hardy, Sarah Orne Jewett, Robert Louis Stevenson, Mark Twain, Edith Wharton, and Walt Whitman. Over the decades of her literary career, Higginson's work commonly met with high critical praise. For example, when her novel Mariella of Out West was published, reviewers compared it to novels by Jane Austen, Leo Tolstoy, and Emile Zola. As one reviewer wrote, Ella Higginson has created her own field in American literature. She has taken a new country and given us new types. There is not another writer in this country today who can compare with her. 
However, by the time, you knew this was coming, by the time she died in 1940, after having lived in Bellingham for 52 years, most of her work was out of print and both she and her writing were almost completely forgotten. Up until now, they have remained virtually forgotten. I would be remiss if I did not add that as much as Higginson is an important, albeit overlooked, figure in American literature, at the same time, more locally, she is also a central figure in the history of Western Washington University. As I have researched Higginson and her writing, I have located evidence of her life and her writing all over Western's campus and in Western's history. I have found Higginson writing about watching Old Main being built and about her long-term deep interest in Western's mission, students, and campus. Often she would have Western the members of Western student clubs over to her house for tea where they would have their club meetings. Now that, that would have been a club meeting to, to attend. Um, though Higginson is not now widely recognized by Western and is indeed very little known on campus, she is nonetheless one of Western's own foremothers. Indeed, she is a member of the Western community, that extended group of people who have devoted years of their time and energy to Western. That is, she is indeed one of us. Part two, the archive. This long-term project, which began a few years ago in Western's archives, has provided me with an avenue for understanding the many jobs that are performed by archival institutions. Most fundamentally, of course, archival institutions preserve and allow access to a range of records that document an array of socio-historical issues. They provide a vital documentary heritage that serves what otherwise might be a sometimes unlikely mix of scholars, students, genealogists, and professional and amateur historians, among others. For literary scholarship, which is my discipline, archival materials particularly offer researchers access to a writer's creative practices, cultural moment, and personal life. Such archived materials may include manuscript drafts, working notes and notebooks, correspondences, daily diaries, snapshots, ephemeral documents, family papers, and personal effects. Archival holdings, therefore, have the ability to put pressure on the idea and the interpretation of a literary manuscript, sometimes in ways that is entirely inconvenient. inconvenient I have to tell you where I, th I had an idea and then I looked at something and thought, oh no, that's just, this doesn't make this hold up. Um, and the interpretation of a literary manuscript through the presence of ephemera, artwork, and other non-manuscript material that may be part of the literary archives. The Higginson Collection at the Center for Pacific Northwest Studies, which is utterly cool, um, contains correspondence, writings, newspaper clippings, scrapbooks, ph photographs, and artifacts that document Higginson's life and work. The records in the Higginson Collection span the period from the 1870s through 1940, which is the year of Higginson's death, with most material dated from 1880 onward. Records include drafts and copies of Higginson's published and unpublished novels, screenplays, short stories, and poems, including manuscripts of Mariella of Out West and Alaska the Great Country. Many of these drafts are tantalizingly partial or incomplete, and long before we had any issues of recycling or sustainability in our culture, Ella Higginson wrote on, you know, used as scrap paper drafts of earlier work. So sometimes what's most interesting is on the side that you're not supposed to be looking at. Um, newspaper clippings and scrapbooks contain copies of articles, short stories, and poems written by Higginson, as well as reviews and articles regarding Higginson and her work. I wish to keep our attention for a moment on three particular parts of this collection that have been especially productive for my research, which is not to say they've been convenient, because sometimes they haven't been convenient at all. Um, first, the correspondence that is held at the Center for Pacific Northwest Studies includes letters to Higginson from publishers, editors, and contemporary writers, including, for instance, Pennsylvania poet Lloyd Mifflin, who was known as the most accomplished writer of sonnets in the United States at the time. He, I don't have time to talk about them, but I do think it's interesting that you make your hobby writing sonnets. Um, in any case, um, because Higginson probably destroyed most of her correspondence, I have no evidence of that, but I have no evidence of it. That is, um, 
no letters written, um, written to her from her mother, her sister, her brother, her niece, um, people who I know she corresponded with. So she, I, it, it seems that she very deliberately destroyed most of her correspondence. But because Higginson probably destroyed most of her correspondence, these remaining letters, letters that it seems she did, deliberately did not destroy. It would be as though you went through every single photograph of yourself that existed and got rid of the ones that you didn't like, right? And the ones that remained are the ones that would tell us you know, a great deal about you. The ones that she de deliberately did not destroy provide information that indicates how Higginson may have wanted to be viewed by future scholars. That is, as an important professional writer who corresponded with other writers, editors, and publishers. By itself, this material would certainly be interesting. However, the correspondence trail left by Higginson and preserved in the archives provided evidence that Higginson may not have anticipated. As I tell all my students, if you want any private papers to be um, hidden from the future, the safest place for them is between the logs of a burning fire, okay? If you do not put them there, people like me will find them in the future. <laughs> that is, once I had examined this correspondence, I gleaned su su sufficient information to turn to other archival holdings across the nation, a process that, for instance, led me to Indiana University, which, as it turned out, holds letters written by Higginson herself to editor S.S. McClure, editor of McClure's magazine. Additionally, I located and was able to purchase for far too much money. Um, I have never been particularly sympathetic to, um, to the monomania of Captain Ahab in Moby Dick until I began this project. And so now, now I, I feel like I feel very close to Ahab and his monomania, <laughs> which is not, it's not good. Um, um, additionally, I located and was able to purchase, and the people who sell these things, they are the descendants of Jesse James. There is no doubt about it. In any case, yeah. where was I? Okay, um, yeah. Books by Lloyd Mifflin, which had once been part of Higginson's personal library and which contained Mifflin's lengthy inscriptions to Higginson. So, so this was one of a kind material. Thus, my study of the Higginson materials at the Center for Pacific Northwest Study cost me a bunch of money, um, led me to search different archival holdings that I would not have otherwise known to consult. The information that I located regarding Higginson and her literary work confirmed some of my ideas and destabilized others. Secondly, the collection at the Center for Pacific Northwest Studies also contains a small number of published short stories and poems written by Higginson's sister, Carrie Blake Morgan, as well as a reference to a book of poetry by her. Morgan is otherwise completely invisible in the literary record. I found it to be mildly interesting that Higginson's sister had published what I then believed, please notice my verb tense there, um, what I then believed to be a handful of poems and stories. I wondered if these pieces, as well as her book of poetry, had been published with Higginson's influential help. However, once I examined these clippings, it became evident that Morgan's work had been published in popular periodicals of the time with fairly large circulations. Such periodicals typically published writers who were more well-known and prolific, which Morgan did not seem to have been. Puzzled, I took a detour from my work on Higginson, among many detours, um, on my work on Higginson herself to search digital archives where I discovered something I had not expected at all. It was not that Carrie Blake Morgan had only published a few poems and stories in periodicals. Rather, I learned that only a few pieces of the larger body of her writing had survived together and had been preserved in the archives. The rest of her published writing is scattered in old collected, per uncollected periodicals and newly digitized archives. At my most recent count, I have located almost 50 published poems and stories written by Carrie Blake Morgan. I have also located a letter in which Higginson discusses how she convinced her sister to allow her to publish a book of her poetry. And thirdly, the ephemera that is held in the Higginson collection contains photographic prints and negatives of Higginson, her family, and her friends. Artifacts include printing blocks with images of Higginson, her signature stamp, and her prized Red Cross medal that she was awarded um, during World War I. 
Such items hold significance beyond details of Higginson's life. Higginson's retention of these items is as provocative as their existence. What she held on to is very interesting, and she made sure that she didn't hold on to everything. To cite just one example, the specific reason for the signature stamp was later revealed to me in a letter written by Higginson that I had recovered. In the letter, she spoke of the physical pain that resulted from her signing so many copies of her books. That is, the surviving signature stamp which she had made signals the popularity of her books as well as the numerous copies that she was asked to autograph at the peak of her fame. The Bellingham Public Library received the Higginson materials in 1944. Four years after Higginson died, um, her estate was tied up in the courts for quite a while um, as a bequest from the Higginson estate. The library later, in 1998, donated these materials to the Center for Pacific Northwest Studies. The way that these materials were preserved and curated across the decades underscores the complexity of these sources and the decisions that were made about them. For example, in 1944, and for that matter in 1998, it was not common to recognize the name or the literary significance of the once celebrated New England writer Sarah Orne Jewett. But a librarian or an archivist nonetheless preserved the letters from Jewett to Higginson, allowing this, in, this part of this important literary correspondence to survive. Um, I just about lost my mind when I realized that there was correspondence from Jewett to um, Higginson. Among Higginson's surviving letters is a cordial, infrequent correspondence with Jewett, whose work she greatly admired. The tenderness, poetry, and delicate humor of Miss, Hig uh, Miss Jewett's stories are unequaled. In a 26 December, in a 26 December note, Jewett responded to Higginson's, having mailed her a copy of Four Leaf Clover, Higginson's most well poem, most well known poem, and a small piece of fir branch, which was in reference to Jewett's recently published book, Country of the Pointed Firs. In reply, Jewett wrote that she had asked her publisher to send Higginson a copy of her latest book, enclosed a blossom from her yard, and praised four-leaf clover, exclaiming, it is exquisite. Exquisite is underlined, and then there's an exclamation mark. I like it best of all, another exclamation mark. In a 17 January postcard printed with a picture of her South Berwick, Maine home, Jewett wrote, I want to return your kind Christmas card with late enough New Year wishes, but I have been ill. How I wish that I could open your door and that you could come to mine. In another letter now lost, Jewett wrote, there is a different quality in your verse, which must come from your unworn surroundings, the idea of the Pacific Northwest region. Similar decisions resulted in the crucial preservation in the literary archive of nearly a thousand pages of Higginson's handwritten and typed drafts of the novel Mariella. My very brief examination of these drafts thus far has revealed that Higginson changed the novel considerably. And, and to say that she changed it considerably is actually inaccurate. She changed it dramatically, where c the main characters show up in much later drafts. The plot is entirely different, and, and a very significant part of, of the drama is, doesn't show up until, until she's halfway through writing the novel. Um, her revision significantly altered the book's plot. In future editorial work that I hope to perform on Mariella, maybe because I'm just a glutton for work, I guess, um, these drafts will enable me to examine the implications of Higginson's decisions for readers and for critics. The depth of the Higginson collection at the Center for Pacific Northwest Studies has been so fascinating that as my work has proceeded, I have been drawn to assemble my own related micro-archive of Higginson material. Documents, details, and references in the Higginson collection have led me to material located in various archives across the country. Among other acquisitions, I have so far obtained copies of almost 100 letters written by Higginson that had never before been gathered together and that would absolutely appall her. Um, and my apologies to her for that. Um, for example, and these are letters I was actually working with today, um, just too exciting. For example, toward the end of her life, Higginson was contacted by Oregon literary historian 
um, Alfred J. Dean Powers, who wrote to her hoping to gather information for his comprehensive study, History of Oregon Literature. Um, Higginson had grown up in Oregon and did not move to, um, to Bellingham until, um, until her early 20s. And Alfred Powers was one of the only ones who, real, outside of Bellingham, who remembered her. And indeed, when he first wanted to get in touch with her, he had to find out if she was alive, if she was still alive or not. But once he found out that she was alive, he began to write to her extremely diplomatically, it seems. Um, his letters to her, of course, do not survive, but her letters to him do. Extremely diplomatically, but also extremely persistently. Powers' initial request led to an extensive correspondence with Higginson. Though Powers' letters to Higginson have not been recovered, Powers preserved the detailed letters that Higginson wrote in response to his queries about her life, her writings, and other writers she had known. In these letters, Higginson dedicated herself to helping Powers with his project of preserving Oregon literature, an endeavor she admired and viewed as important. Much of what we know about Higginson's life today is contained in these letters. The 20 letters that survived from this correspondence were written from May 1935 to December 1938, Higginson dies in 1940, and comprise over 100 pages of Higginson's writing. She writes very lengthy letters to Powers, along with clip, and she always includes things in her letters, along with clippings of literary reviews, photos of Higginson, her house, and her dogs. Um, she was a huge dog lover, so you really couldn't write to her without her sending you a picture of her dog. And I have to interrupt myself just for one minute, because I was telling Clarissa, this is something I figured out today for the first time. One of her dogs, she typically named her dogs Clover, for four leaf clover, obviously reasons. Um, and a couple of them were also named um, Fluffy. Um, <laughs> but in this letter I was reading today, she was talking about the name of her dog. And it, it could, I could tell from the sentence that this was meant to be a joke, that something was meant to be funny. But I didn't understand what was funny about it, which is a very unpleasant feeling. Um, and you know how sometimes you only really get something when you say it out loud, right? And so she was saying she had a dog who's, that her dog's name was Home, H-O-M-E, with a dash and then Brun, like the bear, B-R-U-I-N. And I was thinking this was some large dog. But then she said afterwards, she wrote, please laugh. And I thought, I don't get this. Until I said it out, out loud and realized that we were in the middle of um, the Volstead Act. We were in the middle of prohibition. You're getting it. And the dog's name is Home Bruin. Uh, <laughs> I know, I know. But only once I said, and I thought, oh, thank God, I understand this now. Um, um, where was I? Poems by Higginson that she copied for Powers in her own hand. In these letters, Higginson reflected on her childhood in Oregon and provided substantial information about her family and her literary career. Very early in this correspondence, she recognized that she was uncharacteristically revealing a great deal. And now, insatiable man, what shall I say to you? I have told you a thousand times more about my inmost me than I have told all others together. Yet here you come, crying for more. Higginson also, and, and, you know, Powers just kept writing. Higginson also seemed aware that this might be her final opportunity to recount her life as she wished it to be viewed. In the same letter, she emphasized, I have lived a full, rich, joyous, joyous is underlined. I have lived a full, rich, joyous, everyday life. My, archi sorry, my archival work on this project has also taken me, as it has taken so many other scholars in the 21st century, directly to the intersection where the digital age meets physical, paper-based traces of literary production and interpretation. As various archives have become more readily and excitingly available in digital form, I have been able to employ digital tools to determine, for instance, the provenance of undated paper clippings, um, undated paper clippings, or to locate previously lost published work by, for instance, Carrie Blake Morgan. I have also been able to use such textual recovery work in my courses and in my class assignments. Finally. Archival work has underscored for me the significant dialogue, collaboration, and shared concerns of literary critics and archivists who work with literary collections. I have had so many exchanges during this project with Beth and Ruth and Tamara and Roz, and I am very grateful that they never blocked my email address. Um, and there are times when I was sure that Tamara was going to change her name, dye her hair, and leave the state, and I would still be stalking her for information that only she would have. Um, you can run, but you can't hide. <laughs> 
The disciplinary boundaries of different types of archival work become more permeable when we recognize the influence that collecting, cataloging, and interpretive activities have on each other. What has been called the archival turn in literary, in literary criticism examines what the archive has to offer literary criticism and how scholars use literary manuscripts to inform their research. Archival theory can be employed to better understand the nature not only of literary archives but of literary composition and criticism. The archives are remarkable sources that enable us to investigate the editorial process and the ways that authorial legacies are consciously shaped through the composition and the disposition of their papers. Archival practice and custodial interventions, um, and I have been grateful, I think, for every moment that I've spent in the archives where I can see the um, you know, the footprints of people who have saved these papers and make, made sure that they were together for someone to find at some point. Archival practice and custodial interventions actively shape the literary archive and necessarily affect the interpretation of archival collections. I would like to close appropriately with the poem that Higginson wrote about Western. And because we have such a wonderful um, sunny day, the shades are down. But were the shades up, we would be looking at the very view that Ella Higginson saw from her house, Clover Hill, which um, stood across the, across the street from where Old Main now stands. So she, um, one and a half stories facing Old Main, four stories facing the bay um, every day for 52 years of her life. That was the view she had. The only thing that remains of her home is a very large rock that's still out there. Um, periodically, I stand by it and mutter things to myself um, that are not, not complimentary about the people who knocked her house down. Um, in any case, in 1904, Higginson wrote to a friend that Dr. George Nash, Western's second president, had approached her like a cyclone to write a poem on the Bellingham State Normal School. She wrote that he has a way of making folks do things, and I knew that I had to do it. The poem that she subsequently wrote was titled The Normal by the Sea, and it was later retitled The College by the Sea. And this is it. This is The College by the Sea um, in 1904. Below the sea, blue as a sapphire, set within a sparkling emerald mountain chain where fir and hemlock needles sift like rain through the voluptuous air. The soft winds fret the waves and beat them wantonly to foam. The golden distances across the sea are shot with rose and purple. Languorously, the silver sea seabirds in wide circles roam. So the sun moves slowly down the flaming west and flings its rays across to set aglow the islands rocking on the cool wave's crest and the great glistening domes of snow on snow. And through the mist, the Olympics flash and float like opals linked around a beating throat. Inspired by God were they that chose this place wherein to build these walls of softest rose, um, Old Main, um, where every slender, I thought that was kind of funny, but it is Old Main, where every slender pane at sunset glows like burnished gold and fires with mystic grace the wooded loveliness of Sea Home Hill. Here is the home of color and of light that is engraved above Eden's Hall, of course. Here is the home of color and of light, perfume of balm tree, singing bird's delight splendor of mist and rainbow, and the still slow flight of butterflies. Sweet, liquid clear, the lark flings to dawn his lyric notes. And what inspired psalmist have we here? What song, pure and thralling sweetness, floats from yonder elm tree in the midnight hush? Tis the entrancing love song of the hermit thrush. Mm. I am, thank you so much. I am happy, I am happy to sign books. I am happy to answer questions. You will be doing me a big favor if you ask me a question, so I will stop, you know, well, I won't stop, but perhaps I'll pause in pestering my loved ones with, you know, information about Ella Higginson. Thank you so much, I do appreciate it. <laughs> yes, please. So why did she disappear? Why, why is this? 
That's a very good question. Um, in one of the letters that she had no intention of anyone ever seeing, she writes about how um, books went out of print. This is, I'm quoting her actually, how books went out of print so rapidly during World War I. So that's one piece of the puzzle, right? The, um, War, then and now, war breaks out, the means of production shifts, right? And producing books is not something that is, is high on the list of, um, of material goods to produce. Um, secondly, books by many then well-known um, American white women writers went out of print so quickly at the beginning of the 20th century. For instance, if you went back to the 19th century and asked anybody if Mary Wilkins Freeman would be forgotten, People would have laughed at you, she was so well known. Um, her books went out of print just as rapidly as Higginson's. Part of this is that as we shifted into the 20th century, we had the rise of some kind of movement that wanted to talk about a body of American literature. We had the rise of sort of the creation of the American university. And because, um, I don't mean to, to disrespect these people because they did very good work, but um, because most editors and professors um, academics, reviewers, were elite white men, you know, they followed their biases just as the rest of us follow our biases. So for instance, they recovered Herman Melville, which was a really big deal, but um, their attention was not on women writers. Many of these women writers were recovered with the rise of the feminist movement in the 1970s and the rise of the black studies movement in the 1980s. However, because of Higginson's regional location in what was considered to be the remote Pacific Northwest, it's wonderful that her papers are here, but they are distant from papers of other people at the time and so other writers who she was classified with. And so, so she has remained, um, her work has remained lagging behind this way. But no, 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 things have gotten better, so that's good. Other questions, please. Hmm? 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 Oh, yes, please. Hmm? Yes, sure. I, I was just wondering um, what kind of writer's community there was for her here in Bellingham at that time, and whether she felt you know, lonely or isolated up here, and whether she used letters to. Oh, that's such a smart question. Um, she writes to Lloyd Mifflin, the, um, the, the Pennsylvania poet, she writes to him after he's given her some, some criticism of her work. She said, you have no idea what it's like to never have anyone to share your work with. So um, she was pretty much, and she had friends in Bellingham, and, and, and um, even though her husband predeceased her by decades, I mean, she was married, but in terms of a, what we would now recognize as a writer's community, hardly anything in Bellingham. And your, your instincts are right on. What she did then through her correspondence is she created a community through um, writing to, to um, writers like Ina Coolbrith in California, um, Bret Hart in California, um, Sarah Orne Jewett and Louise Chandler Moulton in New England. So that's the way that, whoops, that's the way that she circulated her work and got comments on it. Now some of that correspondence has not yet been recovered. So Louise Chandler Moulton, who was a really big deal at the time, apparently gave her very good advice about Mariella of, of um, out west. So that may still be around there someplace, but yes, you're, you're your, your um, sympathetic instincts are correct. She felt very lonely in her, in her artistic work. Yeah, yeah, please, please. Could you tell us more about her life and what brought her to Bellingham? Um, indeed, um, she was born in Kansas and her family moved from Kansas to Oregon when she was two years old. She grew up in various places in Oregon and then once she married, her husband was a druggist from the Northeast once she married, they stayed in Oregon for a few years, and then he decided that he would have better business opportunities, which is hilarious, right? That he would have better business opportunities in, um, up in what, what became Whatcom County, which at the time was known as whatever Whatcom, meaning that they would allow any kind of business in the hopes of making money, right? Um, and he did all right. He did all right in Bellingham. His drugstores thrived. He and his business partners built the Clover Building downtown, which you can still see. Um, and, and after a talk I gave at the museum last year, um, a woman who works in the city planning office, this was completely fun, came up and, and whisp whispered to me, like, you know, there's so much going on at this point, but whispered to me, you have to see the aerial view of the Clover Building. And I thought, why? <laughs> and she said, I'll send it to you. And when you see the aerial view of the Clover Building, it's shaped like a clover. 
Yes, something that's been like utterly forgotten. If you ever told me I'd be looking at an aerial view of a building in Bellingham, I would not have believed you. So, um, so that's how, how they ended up here. And, and Higginson, you know, she formed her own very rich life in Bellingham, but she did not socialize a great deal, even though she had friends. Um, many times she refused social invitations so that she could focus on her writing. Um, so she had a fairly rich life here. Toward the end of her life, she was ill and, and pretty much was not allowed to see visitors. And she is buried, if this helps, she is buried in Bayview Cemetery um, in a self-designed grave marker that is adorned with four-leaf clovers. Thank you very much. <laughs> Other questions? Yes, please. You know, when you were mentioning some of her contemporaries, the women writers that had the three names, you know, <laughs> would it ever have been Ella Rhodes Higginson for her, or would that have made any kind of difference? Or? It's a really good question. Before she got married, she um, published her work under pseudonyms, various odd pseudonyms. I have Ethel and Ray, where we come up with this, I don't know, um, sometimes anonymously. Then once she be was married, she began publishing under the name sometimes Ella Rhodes Higginson, sometimes Ella Higginson, um, not consistently. So for instance, well, no, I was going to tell you something that isn't true. Never mind. Um, so um, it's, it, it went back and forth. It is a little bit tricky. It's made my life a little bit harder because sometimes um, Rhodes is misspelled in, when they publish her work. So instead of R-H-O-A-D-S, it's published R-H-O-D-E-S, which changes things. A distant cousin of her husband's was um, a pretty influential Boston figure, Thomas Wentworth Higginson, who is probably most well known today for being the editor who Emily Dickinson corresponded with. So sometimes when Ella Higginson's work is published, instead of Ella Rhodes Higginson, it's written Ella Wentworth Higginson, which is um, entirely inaccurate um, and makes things a little, a little bit more complicated. So. I got to tell you, Lance, it would be better if she just stuck with one name. It, I mean, it would be, let, let me make that better. It would be better for me if she had just, I mean, she can do whatever she wants to. Yes, yes. Yes, please. This is not so much as a question because the things I was thinking of asking other people had already asked, so thank you. But I want to thank you so much for taking on this monumental project as a gift to us. Oh, that is very nice. And it's not over. <laughs> the metaphor that I use about this, it's as though you were walking down the hall and you saw a little kitty tail, right, going around the corner and you thought, it's a kitty, right? And so you went and you grabbed the tail and all of a sudden there was this huge, huge creature that, um, that, 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 that at times was, was adorable and always <laughs> engaging, but nonetheless was, um, was, was massive. And so when, when the book came out, I mean, this was very exciting because it was, it was the first real tangible building block of the project. And, and it made me think that, this is sort of a grim way to think, but, but <laughs> welcome to my world. Um, um, it made me think that if I were hit by a bus the following day and killed, um, that this would not go out of print again. This work would have been recovered. The recovery has now gone far enough that this cannot go backwards. But as I say, um, there is more to come. And, and as we turn into the first of the year, I'm on sabbatical for a while, so I've sort of been organizing this. As we turn into the first of the year, you will be hearing about the campaign to have a statue of Ella Higginson in Bellingham. As we speak right now in Washington State, there are 37 statues of public historical men, okay? So if you have one in your living room, that does not count. If it's an, a statue that could be any kind of man, you know, not a, that doesn't count either. If it's a statue of a man who was not a historical man, though I don't know who that would have, well, actually I can think of a couple examples, but that doesn't account, count either. So 37 um, in Washington, all of Washington state of, um, of um, public white historical men. Three, three of public, um, I'm sorry, I didn't mean white, sorry take white out of there. Three of public historical women. Um, if you wanted to count the Virgin Mary, there would be four. Um, but when I was thinking of counting the Virgin Mary, just so it would kind of increase the number, I had gone into my colleague Allison Giffen's office and said, look, and you know how when you say something in a way that's deliberately persuasive, so you know, you're indicating the answer you want? I said, so would you would you consider 
of the Virgin Mary to be a public historical figure? And she said, don't be ridiculous. And I thought, damn. So I had to cross that off. And out of those three women, two of them are the same woman. And they are um, Mother Joseph, who, who, whose work I greatly admire, but nonetheless, um, unmarried, desexualized, you know, the, the whole thing. And there was a fourth one of, of um, as some of you have talked, I have talked to you about this, there was a fourth one of Narcissa Whitman in Tacoma, but um, it disappeared in 1960. Who steals a statue of Narcissa Whitman? What kind of odd person does this? Um, and it's never been recovered, so I figure our two choices here is, this is the most attractive one, is that somewhere there is a secret feminist grotto that has a statue of Narcissa Whitman, or it's at the bottom of a ravine someplace. So in any case, you'll be hearing more about this as we turn into the first of the year. Um, and if you have any like really rich feminist relatives who have great historical you know, desires, send me their name. <laughs> Other questions? Yes, please. Who is Higginson Hall named for? Oh, that's such a good question. Higginson Hall is named for Russell Carden Higginson, Ella Higginson's husband, who was on the first, who was a member of the first board of trustees at Western, and who almost had a nervous breakdown when um, when the legislature only gave him only gave them part of the money for Old Main to be constructed. Things do not change at all. And um, this is like Carver Jim, but much earlier, right? And then they waited like four years before they gave them the rest of the money. And so he was on the first board of trustees. So Higginson Hall is named after Russell Carden Higginson and Ella Higginson. But she sort of shows up in the naming, you know, as a secondary figure, right? A supporter of Western, but not, not a member of the first board of trustees. Yeah. I'm almost sorry that, um, that Higginson Hall exists in a way, because then we could have like another building named specifically after Ella Higginson. You can see I'm getting very grand ideas here. <laughs> Other questions? Okay. So I have two questions. I have oh, yes. like which one. Um, one has to do with Ella's self perception in terms of the suffragette movement and, you know, not using modern terms feminist, but how she would frame herself in that way. And my second question, if you, you know, privilege me, mm -hmm. um, is I was so intrigued with your, your comment about, you know, archival research is chasing, chasing a cat's tail in some ways. And so I was wondering how the sort of intensive period in your life of doing archival research has influenced your teaching. Oh, oh, that's a that's a wonderful question. Um, I'm, I'll go backwards. I'll take question, you know, just the second question first. Um, archival research has not only influenced my my research and my teaching. I got to tell you, it's influenced the way I think. Um, just in terms of the assumptions, I'm going to assume that everybody does this because otherwise it would make me feel freakish, but um, just in terms of the kind of assumptions that we walk around with in daily life, um, I have found so many of my assumptions, which I, I promise you were very good assumptions, they really were, about Ella Higginson, I have found them to be utterly dismantled by things I have found in the archives. So it has made me, I think I'm a decent thinker, but it has made me an even better thinker, where now I, I recognize more readily certain kinds kinds of assumptions, and at least, at least I'm less surprised um, when I find out, when I find out that I've been assuming something that's incorrect. It's um, affected my teaching in really interesting ways, not only in terms of the texts that I teach, because now I question myself a lot about certain kinds of material. For instance, books that we do not have any drafts for at all. I would not have guessed, and I, I'm good at this kind of thing. From reading Mariella, I would not ever have guessed that it was revised so significantly. I could have made you the best argument for that book not being revised significantly, because it's so good and it fits together so well. And once I looked at the drafts and realized that, that the, the revisions had been extremely significant, I thought, OK, then the finished product is so good that you almost don't know how good it is in terms of the process she went through. So for books that I teach, works that I teach that we, where we do not have any archival holdings, it's made me a better reader. And it's also allowed me to ask, um, you know, more provocative archival questions in class, such as, for instance, if we had any drafts of um, Herman Melville's Moby Dick, what do you think, which always makes students laugh when they think about drafts of Moby Dick, because um, they think Moby Dick is a draft there, right, to an extent. Um, but you know, what do you think that they would look like? So it's made me, it's made me a, better, um, a better teacher that way. And also it's allowed me, and this is a sort of a personal pleasure, it's allowed me to sort of introduce, you know, 
the sort of treasure hunt that archival work is to my students. Because you, know, you get to a point where you're in a class and you're assigned reading, and it's as though the reading has come to you fully formed, and you're not thinking of everything that's behind it. So to think about um, the sorts of pieces that would be in an archive that would inform the work, that, um, that kind of brings everybody into the same process together. Yeah. Yes, please. I just want to build on that. I understand that you are teaching the first major author course on Ella Higginson this next year. And I in the entire world. In the entire world. <laughs> <laughs> just talk a little bit about how you're thinking about it, how you're organizing it, and what a milestone that is. Um, I, 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 could, I, I could become Ahab-like about that. There's just no <laughs> question about it. Um, at spring quarter, I'll be teaching a major author's course in Ella Higginson, and major author's courses typically are reserved for writers who have a significant body of work and a significant reputation. It has been mind-blowing to me that um, Western students do, of course they don't know, I didn't know, that Western students do not know and do not read Ella Higginson. She walked this very campus. Her house was across the street. So many of her works, the great majority of her works, are set in Bellingham. Um, this is something, if you want an inroad to something that would otherwise otherwise be difficult for you, what better inroad would it be to, than, than to have something that happened in your own backyard? And so the way, um, the way I conceive of the course is, of course, to have students um, you know, read, read a whole lot of Ella Higginson, but also to help them, um, I haven't quite thought of the assignments yet, but also to help them read works by other people who Higginson was influenced by or who corresponded with, out, who she corresponded with outside of the Pacific Northwest, so they can begin, so we can begin to get an idea of Higginson's, um, her, her regional writing, not just setting things in the Northwest, but what the Northwest was like, right, as a place how it shaped people, how it shaped their characters, how it shaped what, what they thought. So, um, so on one hand, you know, the official title of the course is Major Authors, um, Ella Higginson. You know, one of the secret, you know, Invisible Ink titles is, um, is Pacific Northwest writing at, and in the late 19th, early 20th century, or how you know where you live, or well, something like that. Yeah, yeah. So many students have told me they're taking the course. There are more students than there are possibly seats for, but I'm sort of trying. I figure that will happen when the computer crashes. I'll be in my office or something. So, <laughs> other questions? Are you okay? As I say, I am happy to sign books. There are books for sale in the back. I am happy to answer questions up here. Thank you so much for coming. I completely appreciate it.